Ooh, over there. <laughs> Hi, okay. Uh, all right, so uh, we spent most of the semester looking at call by value evaluation, right? Which uh, is, is, is a nice and simple model. It says that when you apply a function, each of the arguments gets evaluated at the point of application one time, right? And then it gets past these values, and then the function continues to compute. Nice and simple. Um, lazy evaluation said, well, why one time? And instead proposed zero times. How about we don't evaluate the arguments, we just pass the arguments, and then see what happens, right? If we never need it, we never need to evaluate it. If we need it, then we need to evaluate it, right? So we've now explored one time and zero times. So what's the natural question you ought to have? Can we extend in the other direction? Yeah, can we extend in the other direction? What about like evaluation more than one time? That seems weird, right? I mean, you call a function, and somehow the function evaluates multiple times. OK, that's what we're going to do in class today. OK? All right. Um, so here's some motivation. Let's say I'm trying to write a little like you know, timer of some sort, OK? So here's JavaScript. Uh, here's a HTML. And I've got some ID called current time. And I have a function called set time, which goes into my document, finds this point, and inserts the current time into the document. Right? Familiar, this much? Good, OK. And if I say on load, I set the time, it comes back and it prints out the time. Right? But it prints out the time how many times? Once. Right? It prints out the time at which the computation started. But if I wanted to build something like a timer, right? that says, you know, here's the elapsed time, and this keeps incrementing 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Well, that's not going to work, right? Because that computation runs only once. So right there is a computation we would like to have, you know, a function that runs multiple times. Right? Now, how do we do this? In JavaScript, it's completely straightforward, right? Here's my same current time. You notice my font has shrunk a little bit. That should be a hint that something's about to change. Um, you know, we'll have an ID for the timer figure out what the elapsed time is. So I have to start the timer. So I have to set an interval that says do something every second. You know, you could do that as a string or as a function. But you know, if you want to be like maximally scripty, you do it as a string, right? Just so like security holes are a good thing. Um, and then you set the interval. You say like every second I would like this timer object to fire. But then the timer object needs to know like what to actually do every second. And so every second it says increment elapsed time by one, get element by D, insert the elapsed time. and then I have to remember to start the timer. And if I want to actually have this reset button to work as well, then I need some sort of you know, thing that actually goes back and resets it. Okay? You've all written code like this like 100 times at this point minimum. right? Every time you write like a Java uh, GUI application, it's the same pattern. I have some object that I create that's a timer or a, you know, a thing that listens to the mouse or a thing that listens to the keyboard or something. And I have to provide a, what's this called? Callback, right? It's the thing that says, when you have something for me, please call me. Because if I try to pull, I might pull at too low a frequency or too high a frequency, and both of those are a problem, right? Like, and for you, things like user input, you don't even know when the user is actually going to type something next, right? And even if you think about it, even if I want to pull every second, I need a timer, which is the thing I'm trying to build, right? So um, this is painful, right? Just just to see how painful this is, let's try to figure out, if I'm a programmer trying to reason about the behavior of this program, okay, what is the behavior of this program? Its goal is to put something in that spot on my, on my page. Right? That's its goal. Where does it get its value from? Well, pretty obviously it gets its value from here, because I'm assigning into current time. Right? Where does it get its value from? Well, it's from elapsed time, which gets its value from, well, the increment on the previous line, which gets its value from, well, if and when do every second is called, which is called over here, which is called because I did set interval, which is called when I do start timer, which happens because it's at the top of the page. But except that's not the only place where I set the value. I also set the value to elapse time zero, and I also set the value over here, which depends upon reset time, which depends upon this. Okay? That's the reasoning you implicitly go through in your head to understand what this program does. Okay? 
So here we have like the most simple program you can imagine writing, right? I want to subtract the current time from a starting time, and I have to deal with timers, initialization, overlap of these things, interference, callbacks, everything. Which is, of course, why we teach this to beginning students in certain courses. But anyway, so maybe there's a better way to write such programs. Right? So as a PL person, the question you should ask is, is this the best we can do, or can we do better? We did this once before. In fact, we saw a similar problem before. This is called the inversion of control. Rather than the program asking for values from the system, the system now calls the program. That's an inversion of the direction of control. And we saw this in the context of web programming, right? Where we had to keep suspending the computation and store these continuations. We said, well, if we have a language that's a little different, maybe we don't have to pay this price. Maybe the programmer can write the program they wanted to write in the first place. Okay? This is another situation. And in principle, we could use continuations here again. But I want to show you a different solution for this problem that's maybe, it's not more general, but it's different. Okay? And in some ways leads to an interesting point of the design space. So the fundamental problem is this. You know, here's, here's a timeline, right? Time is going, progressing in this direction. So I have the world out there, and periodically the world tells me something. It says, hey, a clock ticked, or hey, the user moved the mouse, or hey, the user clicked on the mouse, or hey, the user typed this button. I don't know when it's going to happen, so my program sits here passively. When this event happens in the world, it sends a message to my program by calling this callback. The callback runs a little bit, does something in reaction to this, and then, you know, next event comes, and so on. Now, you are only writing this part. You're writing the program. So somehow, we need communication to happen from the end of the first callback to the beginning of the next callback, from the end of the second callback to the beginning of the third callback, and so on. And if you go back to a language like Java, the return type of all of these callbacks is void. Why is the return type void? Yeah. Do you communicate between them by setting state? Well, no, no, no. Why is the return type void? That's, that, you're saying what the consequence of the return type being void is. But why is the return type void? Yeah. The event loop doesn't care what you're The doing. event loop does not care about your program. Okay? The, the negative way of putting it is profoundly doesn't care about your program. A positive way of putting it is it's a generic event loop. It's an operating system. It's not going to bias itself towards one program or the other. Right? Either way, it doesn't care about your program. Right? So at best, it might get some generic status values back, right? like you know, some, this worked or this didn't work, and resend or something like that. But it doesn't care about your program. It's not going to transport your program's data structures around. Now you could define a different event loop. Those of you who've seen world programming know that's what we do. We return a value here that the operating system sends back. It's like, well, it's, it's, it's parametric. It doesn't look at the value, but it just sends it back. That's a different design for an event loop. But traditional event loops get a void back, which means the only way these things can communicate is through state. Okay? That's the consequence of an API design decision. If you return void, well, they can't have any way of communicating with something else except through mutation and side effects. So this is what we should conclude. Okay? This is a four-letter word. It's forcing us into a state of programming that we don't want. Now, this is not just a JavaScript problem, right? If I wrote corresponding program in Racket, same thing. I'd have all these sends, and basically these would all be void typed if we had a type system in traditional Racket. Um, as we said, Java, four-letter word, right? Um, here's a library from ML. Different four-letter word. Okay? And if you go to some of the traditional Haskell libraries, they're very clever. Their four-letter word is actually five letters because they have a space in the middle. Okay? So traditional GUI libraries all have this problem traditional network libraries, there's the signaling problem. We're trying to get signals, but our goal is to like actually write a high-level description of what we're trying to do, not to write these like tiny little bits of computation that somebody else is going to stitch together. Right? When you have void types, there's only one composition operator, semicolon, sequencing. Right? There is no other composition operator. You can't nest computations. You see this pattern happening again? 
We can't nest computations. We can't say, here's something that computes a value, and here's something that uses that value to compute something bigger. Right? There's this uh, wonderful talk by Simon Bacon Jones about uh, Haskell on the road to Nirvana, and he was, you know, basically his comment at the end of it was, look, we're finally getting to the point where people understand that the point of computation is to construct values and return values, right? It's like side effects versus values, and we're starting to make that transition. Call them objects if you want, right? And we're making that, we're starting to get to that transition, and maybe it'll happen. So for those who like to program in a way that consumes and returns values, this API structure is dangerous. It's ruinous. So previously we saw a case where API bad API structure hurts us. Here's another case. So a key problem is this: the flow of control is all backward, right? Some event happens, either a disk response, keyboard, some stock ticker, or something like that. It comes through the model of the program, and then it has to propagate to all of these places out, you know, all these views that we have, right? Which of course can cause additional control to happen. So the key thing is the world is in charge, not the program. When we write reactive systems, we have to rethink how we design our APIs and how we design our languages. So what kind of information does the world report to us? Well, sometimes it says, you know, something like here's where the mouse currently is, here's a sequence of keystrokes, you know, where's the current location, some AJAX responses, etc., etc., etc. And you can start to see there's a pattern, right? There's something that always has a value but maybe changing underneath even as we're looking at it. And then there are these sequences, sort of these discrete sequences. Now, I'm not going to say much about it in this class, but it turns out you can interconvert between these. They're almost completely interconvertible. Right? And these current things are things like the timer. Sequences are things like the sequence of text clicks here. Right? This, you know, always has a value. You don't know when it's going to change. This, you don't know when the next value is going to come, and there may be an infinite number of them. Right? So it's a classic stream. <coughs> And what we'd really like is when the change occurs, where the change is either this value has changed or the next event occurs, we want the computation to automatically recompute and propagate its changes. Okay? So I'm going to do a quick demo for you. Um, this is a language called Father Time. So I go to the language menu and choose language. And uh, it's an experimental language. Okay, so there's a, a REPL there, right? And it looks just like what you would expect, right? You know, parenthetical expressions, you get answers, okay? Just as you expect. Okay? And you can write a whole bunch of programs, and you'll find that it seems to behave exactly like Racket. Okay? Um, you can ask for current seconds, which is exactly the kind of, you know, the sort of get time thing. And it has exactly the same problem, right? Here's the current time, and it's no longer the current time, right? This is the time when we type the expression. Okay? Except it happens to have a slightly strange thing bound called seconds, right? which again is an identifier bound to a value. Uh, but this value is a little different. Uh, so can I use that value to do something? Well, I could do that. Right? Or I could do, uh, say, uh, and as you can see, they're all in sync. So the point is, these things that are called behaviors are, are kind of sticky properties. Anytime something's a behavior, any expression that depends on a behavior also becomes a behavior, also becomes a behavior all the way out. And every time this changes, it's now the language's responsibility to figure out how to propagate all of these changes. So I could say, for example, uh, okay. and I can nest these expressions arbitrarily. Or let uh, start time be current seconds and minus seconds And this is going to count how many seconds have elapsed since this is my timer, right? That whole callback key program we wrote earlier is just this. So the question is, what would you rather write, right? This is the program you want to be able to write, and all those manual transformations you have to undergo to get that other program, which you then have to maintain at every step and reason about. Yes? So if the different kinds of behavior, how do you trust the language to 
like compose those behaviors. Like here, it's like just a simple increment is happening. Yeah. There could be something else that happens to the basic value. Uh, um. So there are different kinds of behaviors. Like there are behaviors corresponding to say mouse position. Yeah. Or behaviors corresponding to you know things like keystrokes and so forth. You can make, you can synthesize your own behaviors. Right? I mean, in fact, here's that's what I've done. I've synthesized a behavior representing this compound expression. So okay. To understand how the language like composes those behaviors to, to use this language. So the beauty of the of the of this idea, this is called functional reactor programming. Um, and Father Time implements something called transparent functional reactor programming in that you don't have to write explicit reactive operators. We're going to see in a few minutes a slightly different version of the language maybe where you do. Uh, which are you going to do the compiler demo or not? I, I can't get it. Do it straight. Do it straight. Demo. Yeah. Do it straight. Okay. So um, the key thing is any t so the language gives you a some formal properties about its evaluation model. So I might have a computation that depends on two different behaviors, right? So it's actually quite common that you might write an expression that says, um, every second I want this to happen, but if a keystroke comes in, I want this other thing to happen, okay? Or you know, you're you're writing something that says, um, uh, I don't want something to happen. Uh, you know, as you're typing keystrokes, I want something to pause for a certain period of time before something else happens. So you've got all these different event sources coming in and providing behaviors to your work, right? The guarantee is that every time a behavior updates, all the dependent computations will update, okay? And if there are multiple behaviors coming, so, so there's, there's, there's sort of this, uh, so, so the active evaluation constructs a data flow graph, okay? And, and I describe it in the, in, the, in the textbook, actually there's a somewhat clever idea so we can use the existing Dr. Racket runtime to create the graph rather than having to write a new interpreter for it. I mean, you can imagine, right, writing a new interpreter or compiler for language. The clever thing in Father Time is it actually reuses the existing evaluation strategy to build this graph, okay? And then the property is that all values are propagated in a topological order so that you will never see an inconsistent computation, right? So for example, if I say, uh, you know, here's, here's something. So I'm asking whether seconds is less than add one of seconds. What do you expect that to be? Sure. We expect that to be, you know, forever true. Now, one thing we can do is just stare at this for a very long time to see if it flips. Okay. Um, I'm not going to because I'm hoping it won't. And the reason I'm hoping it won't is because there's a theorem that says it won't. Okay? Well, don't make it worse by shouting. Okay? So there's a theorem that says that it won't, and the reason is because. Um, there's seconds down here, and it's propagating to the less than node, and also to the add one, which is propagating to the less than node. Right? Because it does this in a topological order, it always does the add one before it does the less than, and therefore it will always subtract, it will always check seconds minus something that's one bigger than seconds, and therefore it will always be true. Okay? So there are some underlying theorems like that about the evaluation order that ensure that even when you combine these behaviors from different sources, um, you, you ultimately want to know that I've written here something that's like an invariant statement, right? And I want to know that those invariants are truly invariant, that they will always be preserved, and these theorems are the things that guarantee that those things truly are invariant. Okay. Other quick questions about this? Okay. So what we wanted to do was to give you another demo, a slightly longer demo, and uh, this time we want to show you a version based on JavaScript instead, since you're all like hacksaws, right? Uh, so this is called Flapjacks, and Flapjacks is a similar idea but built on top of JavaScript. And Joe, you're going to yeah, take sure. it away? <clears throat> I won't wear this ridiculous thing. It's because they're submitting a paper today, and they have to dress up on that topic. Uh, oh, oh, right, of course, you have a paper. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you have written at least some JavaScript code before, ever? So we're going to build this uh, filter list. I'm sure you've seen things like this before on web pages that you visited. If I just start to type here, I just grab like 
7,000 words out of a dictionary that are seven letters long. And as I type in this filter list, we see the list of things that are there expand and contract. Uh, just, and it's just any substring that matches. So uh, we're going to build this thing up uh, using this language called flapjacks uh, that I have an editor open for on the right-hand side. So the, this window, which doesn't have anything working in it yet, is uh, exactly what is being shown in this editor here. So the top few lines here, this is just saying, hey, this is an HTML file. Uh, this is sort of like saying hash line flapjacks. Uh, Dictionary.js, I just have preloaded a nice little JavaScript file here uh, that has a whole bunch of words in it, uh, saved into a variable called dict. So dict will be a global variable we can talk about uh, in, the, in the HTML file. And this thing is just uh, a whole bunch of styles to make the blue and green things show up. Okay, so the actual data that's on this page, uh, there's sort of, you should be able to see some clear correspondence. There's a label that's labeling this text box, and I've given names to three important things here. One of the things is the text box where we'll type is called filter input. The text box where we'll show uh, what the current filter is is called filter on, and the um, div that you can't see uh, because there's nothing in it now that's sitting below there is called words, and that's where we're going to put all the words. Okay. So for a little bit of a warm-up to show just what it looks like to use flapjacks, uh, what flapjacks lets us do is get out things like the value of an, a of an HTML element or a, a DOM element, they're called when they're on the page, as a behavior, as a time-varying value. So what that looks like is I can say, uh, the current filter text is going to be uh, everything in flapjacks is just f prefixed. Um, I can get the value out of something on the page. And I guess let's do a new line here so I don't go over the edge. And dollar, if any of you are uh, jQuery programmers, flapjacks has dollar sort of like jQuery, which lets me ask for this thing on the page. So this is saying that this variable called the filter b is going to always have contained in it the current value of that text box. Now, if I save this and run it over here, nothing happens yet because all I did is declare some new variable. So we have to put it somewhere if we want to see it do anything. So Flapjacks lets us take these time varying values and stick them into the page. Okay. And there's another f prefix function that lets us do that. Um, actually, let me do one thing before I do before I uh, before I do that. So right now, uh, what uh, I, I guess maybe you can guess, but maybe I should just tell you the kind of thing that comes out of this value is just a string. The kinds of values that are in text boxes, the type of this thing is a time varying string. So what Flapjacks will let us do is uh, turn time varying, stick time varying strings into new pieces of stuff that we're going to put on the page. So I can say the, and uh, if you know, span is just a, a, just like this span. It's a kind of uh, HTML element that we can stick in the page. So I can create a span that ha always has the current uh, value of the filter box. And now I'm going to stick that thing into the page. So I can say, insert a DOM behavior. And I'm going to put th that thing in there, so the span that's always going to hold the current value of the text box. And then I have to tell it where I want it to go. And the placeholder called filter on is where I want it to go. And if I haven't made any of the usual JavaScript syntax errors, uh, oh, nice, that gets wider when it does that, doesn't it? Okay. So now, this thing is much like the, the numbers that we're showing up in the Dr. Racket example. It's always just reflecting the current value of what's in that filter box. So I haven't done anything to say, every time I type, update the value of the other thing. All that happens is, this value is always being updated in the background by flapjacks and being propagated to all the places where that time varying value has been stuck in somewhere. Okay? 
<clears throat> so that stuff can stay up there. So the next thing we want to do is actually get the dictionary words from that dictionary file on so page. Nobody's asking any questions, which means you're almost certainly not making sense. Jonah. Why did you have to wrap that thing in a spam before you put it into the program? Uh, the type of insert Dombey is, is two DOM things, and it sticks one inside the other. It just doesn't know how to automatically turn text into a DOM node. Did everybody understand the answer, the question and the answer there? Yeah? Another question? So is it actually executing a script every moment or something? Yeah, so uh, the Flapjacks is pretty smart about when it, when, it, when it propagates all the new data. So it does it on things like a keystroke that changes one of these things. Or if you've set up timers, it does it on those timers firing. But just, just to point out, when I showed you the initial example on my slides, the do every second, that callback was run every second. That's why it's called do every second, right? It really does happen every second. So ultimately, if you're building a reactive system, something is running sort of every time something triggers, some underlying event triggers. The only question then is, is Flapjack's doing even more behavior than what would have happened if you'd written it by hand? And the answer is generally no. It's smart about trying to not create unnecessary handlers and launchers and stuff like that. But it could, there could be some cases where you could make a really smart strategy like, look, I know that even though I want to do this every second, the GUI doesn't update except every two seconds, so I'll only install the handler to call every two seconds and do some back patching. You, you can always do things like that, right? It's not smart enough to do that. Now, in principle, it has the information, so you could write a program analyzer to go back and discover some of those. It doesn't do those kinds of things. Okay? But otherwise, it's the same thing that's happening even otherwise, right? In your Java code, your JavaScript code, you are running these things all the time. So is it just like a wrapper? Yeah, so there's actually a somewhat clever wrapping strategy where it installs the callbacks for you automatically and then converts the, uh, we can talk about that after after Joe's done with the example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But it, right, in general, Flapjacks is just doing the work of every time you create one of these, this span thing is a call into Flapjacks. And Flapjacks knows that when you create a new span, it needs to hook up events from that span to other things that you create that, that might also be time varying and depend on it. Okay. Yep. So it's not F prefix, but span is from Flapjacks too. But span is from Flapjacks too. Are all like the, it, it, there's a there's a capital function for every okay. effectively every kind of DOM element. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's just because the way other libraries do that is kind of crazy. So yeah, those are provided by Flapjacks too. And they are implicitly behaviors, not just raw elements. Yeah. OK, so the next thing that we're going to do just to uh, get these words onto the page is put them there as, cons as just a constant list of words on the page. And then we'll do the work that makes them update to filter on whatever we type in. So uh, for uh, the current filter text, what we did is we got a behavior from somewhere. Uh, in this case, it came out of the page. We created a DOM wrapper around that behavior, and then we stuck the DOM wrapper in the page. So we're going to follow those same three steps for the dictionary words. So first, we're going to uh, uh, create a behavior, and then we're going to uh, create DOM object out of behavior, and then we're going to put DOM in the page. Okay. okay. So the behavior we're going to create to start, like, uh, like I just said, is going to be constant and dumb. We're going to come back and make it have the dynamic behavior we want. Okay. So we're going to say uh, there is a thing inside flapjacks called constant b. Dict is the name of the variable that holds this list of words. Uh, constant b is much like when Trium was running just plus one two inside father time. That was a bit, that could be a time varying value, it just didn't vary with time. So it was the constant value three all the time. So this is right now the constant value, the, the list of words all the time. So to um, create the, this DOM object, we're gonna, uh, much like before, say the words list. And uh, we're gonna create an unordered list thing. So ULs are a kind of HTML tag. And the uh, Flapjacks ULs 
expect that we give them a behavior that has a list of DOM elements in it. So the, it can be a time varying value of a list of DOM elements, and it'll keep showing that list of things inside. So uh, we have a behavior, the words v, which is constant right now. Later it won't be constant. And uh, the, what Shriram was saying earlier is about things being explicit versus being implicit when you, do, when you perform operations. In flapjacks, what we have to do here uh, is there's a function called lift b that's defined on behaviors that says, I have a time varying value and I want to transform it into another time varying value. And the transformation is defined by this function that I hand to lift b. So I'm going to take this time varying value that's a list and apply a function to the list and get back another value and that thing is going to be sort of put back inside the time varying box. Okay, So I'm going to have uh, the words, so the, the list itself unwrapped from the behavior that it was that it was in from uh, the words B. And what I'm going to do is now that I just have a list of strings, I'm going to create a uh, 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 an array of list elements inside JavaScript to return here. So I um, can map over the words and create a list element for each word. What is it? Necessary to what? Like, where's the lift be necessary? Uh, the so the the call to constant be wrapped this list of strings in a, sort of a, a, a it's called a behavior. It's the box that says there's a time varying value inside here that'll keep updating. And uh, the JavaScript code can't see can't manipulate that time varying value directly. It gives a function to flapjacks that flapjacks calls when things update to change the time varying value inside. Mm, why is that um, a property of the word to be and not just f? Uh, it's only convenience that it's on the word to be. I mean, it, could be it, it actually is on f also. So if it varied on some other value in the expression, uh, would it also Okay to use the words be like mm -hmm. uh, you just take some other um, behavior and call its lift b with the same contents. Would it would it give you the same result? Uh, so if I you mean if I called uh, instead of the words be here, I did say the filter b. Yeah. Then what would happen is uh, when the filter b would change this function would be called here to update the, to you know, be creating the, the, the new value inside the new time varying value we're creating. And this thing, instead of being a list of strings, would be the single string that's this thing here. So it would be, this, that would be defining a, if I used the filter b dot lift b, that's defining a transformer over time varying string values. So in some sense this is just a callback. Uh, then. Right, but the um, the like the is like unupdated. Right? It's returning a. Uh, but notice that the callback actually is returning a value. It's not having side effects and returning void. Hmm. Right. So this is actually returning a new value that you can do further lifts and stick into the DOM operations on. And we'll always keep track of its current internal value. Okay. Um, John, is that first return? That's, it seems like it's not in the function. Thank you. And then I also have a question, mm -hmm. which is: it seems like what we were trying to accomplish was wrapping each word in the dictionary in. Uh, one of those li things. Mm -hmm. Why didn't we do that when we created the behavior before we made the constant? Uh, because we're going to do something more interesting here next, and it's useful to have them as strings for what we're going to do, and then create the DOM elements out of the filtered list of strings we're going to do. Okay. Is that? Maybe. 
answer your question? I mean, yes, but I'm still unconvinced. Yes, but you're still unconvinced? Okay, we'll see. Um, so let's make sure I typed all the JavaScript correctly um, and can actually run this thing. semicolons after the arguments. Thank you. Just that one, right? Is that a tick mark next to the open brace? Or is this one large on the screen? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's semicolons. That one should be there. This one is the return statement of this function. So the problem is that we've defined a thing and we haven't stuck it in the page yet. So we have another variable that doesn't show up anywhere in the page. Uh, so let's follow the last step here, which should look a lot like this step, this third step here, of just sticking in the page at some point where we want it. So that's going to be an insert again. And we're going to take the things that we just, the thing that we just created, the list, and we're going to put it in at our words container. Yep. It's words, plural. Uh, the words list. Thank you. Okay. So now we've done all the hard work. And we can do the actual uh, filtering here that uh, will take what we've typed and uh, pare this list down to just what matches. So uh, does anyone have an idea of where, so the thing we're going to change is this, is this constant statement. We don't want this dictionary to always be the same dictionary. We want it to be something that reflects this filtering over whatever we've typed in. So uh, does anyone have an idea of what kind of thing we might try and put here instead? Okay, so what uh, what kind what thing is that? So a function over the changing query. How do I right? Okay, so I'm going to lift over the changing query. So uh, this is going to be let's call it uh, uh, I guess we can call it filter. Get rid of that. Okay. So filter inside here is, where, is going to be uh, the current value of that thing. Um, so what, so uh, what kind of thing do we want to return from in here? What was inside the words be before? Yeah, a list of strings. So we want to return a list of strings here. What list of strings do we want to return? So we're going to do dict dot. Oh, we need to return here. We basically want to filter by substring. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have the dictionary word, and then we have the thing we want to filter on. And the easiest way to check this is to do something like. In JavaScript, I'm pretty sure that's the easiest way to actually check if a substring is there. Okay, great. So should this just work? Oh. Hmm? That's okay. Yeah. Yeah? I'm just unused to JavaScript's like dict dot filter is. Yeah. Oh, oh, of the it's sort like, of, of the, 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 the like filter. Oh, oh, filter pattern instead. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let's see if this works. Oh, hey, it works. So what we're getting out of here is that really when I type the the words be is being really filtered down into this value that only contains what matches, and that's what's stuck in. And Flapjack is taking care of updating that for us. So if you had multiple dependencies, mm -hmm. like, um, um, I guess if you wanted to, in this case, we uh, you chose the filter behavior as Thing to 
like sort of feed the callback to. Yep. What if uh, you had, I don't know, two, two filters or something, like a start filter and end filter? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, would you just nest them? Like, you just choose an order and, and like put one inside the other, or? There's, so there's a, a few things you can do to uh, combine different behaviors, right? Where you can say, uh, I want to, uh, uh, you uh, actually it might be that there is a definition of list that just takes multiple arguments and lets you combine multiple behaviors at a time. I think that's actually the API Flapjax gives you. So if you have two behaviors and you want to define a new behavior you just in terms of those, you the behavior. right? You lift over two of them and produce a combined value. Um, so there's actually an entire library of combinators for behaviors for things like things like that. There's also uh, things like the if behavior that takes three behaviors, and whenever the, the first one is true, it, it's the value of the first behavior, and whenever the first thing is false, it's the value of the second, the third behavior. I think that, was there another question in the middle here? No? I was just thinking of a way to conceptualize this, since you're not explicitly filtering every, you're not sort of explicitly iterating and filtering, um, you might think of the filter as more like a mask or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you but mean by not explicitly filtering? I mean, does explicit work filter? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, are, you are explicitly defining a filter, but <coughs> it is a oh, I think. static thing that sits there rather than... No, I think the dicta filter is sort of like a... Let, let me go back to what I started the lecture with. Right? We started the lecture by saying, look, we have eager evaluation, which evaluates all the arguments once. Lazy evaluation is evaluate all the arguments zero times for now. Right? And we're now going to consider a case where evaluation of arguments may happen multiple times. And you say, well, what sense would that make? Well, the sense that makes is if the function depends upon values that might change, then every time the value changes, the function recomputes so that you always get a consistent view of the world. So you write filter one. So it is certainly the case that you have the strange behavior, strange to our traditional eyes, which is I write an expression with, I write a program that has no loops, nothing, right? I write, you know, plus one seconds. Right? There's no loop, there's just a plus one seconds. This is the most non-loop free program you can imagine. And yet it keeps updating its value, so clearly there's a loop somewhere, right? That's what I meant by evaluates its argument many times. So yes, you write what looks like a static function, a static description of filter, but because the value it depends on changes, that filter happens as many times as necessary. Okay, no, that, I mean, that's what I meant, is what you're exposing to the user, to the programmer in this language, is, is more of a, is this, is yes, something we are they don't pushing, have to explicitly loop over. We are pushing more static views of the world, yeah. so that because more static you are, the easier it is to reason about programs, and the more declarative a description you have written, okay? So if you can push some of the dynamics into the language rather than into the program, that's always a good thing because the language can give you theorems like, you know, I will not have these glitches when I evaluate. You'll always get answers that are consistent with the text of the program, right? And now if your text of your program is more static, well, hey, now you really win, right? Your language guarantees that the static thing that you can read and understand is actually going to be maintained for you. And if you think about like typical, you know, GUI layout things, right? There's all over the place, like in CSS, you end up doing this sort of hacking this together in CSS. You want to say, this is always 50% of that, right? Or this color is dependent on that. Every time I mouse over this, I want the color to change. So what happens in CSS? You say, on mouse in, and, or I forget the names, but like when the mouse comes in, you do this, and the mouse goes out, you do that, right? What you're really trying to say is, the color is red except when the mouse is over me and then it's blue. You can't say that, right? Here, that's exactly what you can say. And that's a static statement. It's a policy, and policies are static descriptions. You can write the policy and let the runtime engine figure out the effect of that policy at each instant in time for you. Okay. Right? So it's like database queries, right? You write a static query, and you want to imagine that whenever the database changes, you want to imagine that the thing gets filtered through. That's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> right. so I'm actually saying something sensible. You make saying something extremely sensible. You're exactly right. We are trying to make things more static. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The old, right. So in this in this code, we can look at all the places where there's actually an operation that has a side effect, uh, and it's only these top level var statements. 
and the stick it in the DOM statements. The function that filters and returns this new list is completely purely functional, and the thing that lists and creates new list elements here is also functional. So the, the, the answer to why it's different from a callback is that we didn't use side effects inside these functions to exfiltrate data to the rest of our program. Right? We didn't have to like sneak it out with, a, with an assignment statement during the callback. Flatjacks gave us an abstraction of this behavior that keeps track of the value inside for us. So we can program functionally when we uh, sort of underneath these behavior boxes. Um, so one other, one other nice thing along these lines about why you would want these behavior-like values instead of having uh, to use side effects to maintain your state, here's just a, a really neat small feature inside Flapjacks that makes this composition clear. So this thing jerks around a lot when we're typing, like it really immediately uh, switches things. And sometimes, you know, UIs, when you are typing and things are changing really, really fast, you know, the, uh, the, the fancier websites will slow it down and they'll only update it like every half second, calm you know? Calm down the user interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, calm it down. Yeah. Right? Just sort of make it not so, not so, not so, uh, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, so, let's try and do that. So, just uh, calm down. Um, <laughs> Please, uh, don't update so much. So that'll be a thousand milliseconds. So now, you know, after a second, like, <laughs> do your thing, right? So this little calm B here was co a completely compositional operation in this chain of things that we were doing. It gave us back a new behavior of the same type of behavior of strings that we could plug into other places in the computation. We didn't have to add a new timeout to wait for the side effect to happen with a little thing that checks for null before it does any work and, or anything like that, right? This was a, a completely compositional thing in our sort of chain of docs that was building up. It became thing. more static. It was exactly. a more static yep. description of what you were going to say otherwise. Yep. So this updates the filtered list a uh, thousand milliseconds after the user stops typing? Uh, no. <laughs> it just, so that's, that would be a delay. That's called delay. That says delay everything by a milli thousand milliseconds, but it would just be just as hyperactive, except it would be like a thousand, there would be a second's lag in addition, so it would be like doubly annoying, right? <laughs> Whereas Combi is saying, wait for a thousand milliseconds. If there's an update, don't, don't let anything happen, right? That, that doesn't trigger, but when there's no update for a thousand milliseconds, then you send your event out. Uh, okay. Is there a delay? Is it just called that? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so this every event it's waiting so you can see them sort of typing as I type them, but a second later. So and column B is more like it's accumulating all the results into one result, but then it fires once the, the sort of hyperactive delay has passed. Yeah. 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 So and so the question about callbacks was basically what it does is that the, the underlying primitives is a bidirectional pipe basically. And so it can install as a callback one end of the pipe. The other end of the pipe shows up as a behavior in Flapjack's world. And then you can also use that for output, right? You have a pipe, behaviors are one end of the pipe, the other end of the pipe is something that goes out to the GUI. And there's a very nice result that was actually done by a Brown undergrad, Dan Ignatoff. Uh, he did his, his like senior honors work. Um, he showed how you can express these pipes and thereby if you have a well-structured GUI,